hepatitis C. And there were 361 with HIV were still alive. Lord Winston has referred to that episode as the greatest treatment tragedy in the history of the NHS. Yes. Our terms of reference were, and I quote, to investigate the circumstances surrounding the supply to patients of contaminated NHS blood and blood products, its consequences to the hemophilia community and others afflicted, and suggest further steps to address both their problems and needs and those of bereaved families. It raises a number of questions. Could it have been avoided? What decisions or indecisions gave rise to the chain of events? What lessons has the experience taught us or should have taught us? One aspect of the tragedy arises from the fact that the infection has deprived many sufferers of the ability to work and so has led to serious financial problems. Some have lost the pensions on which they rely for their retirement. Sufferers and their families incur expenses for special diet, and treatment, and consequent travel. Many countries have experienced similar tragedies, and governments have made some financial provision, including the United Kingdom. There have been long debates as to the adequacy of the provision. <coughs> there have been discussions as to what further provision could be made to help alleviate the suffering. And there are questions about whether the government, or rather successive governments, should share the blame for what happened, and what is the relevance of arguments about who, if anyone, <coughs> is fault. Mm -hmm. For many years, sufferers and their families have asked successive governments to establish a public inquiry. They have always declined. They say that everything there is to know is already known and in the public domain. Mm. That isn't strictly true, since there are some documents relating to these events which the government has declined to disclose under the exceptions in the Freedom of Information Act, and, and others where parts of the copies are, are blacked out. But more importantly, there's a feeling that offering masses of documents on a take it or leave it basis <coughs> isn't a substitute for questions and answers in a public forum. Mm -hmm. So having for many years pressed the government to establish an inquiry in the House of Commons and later in the Lords, mm -hmm. with support from all parties, Lord Morris established uh, this inquiry. He announced our establishment on the 19th of February 2007. So we are coming up to the mm -hmm. second anniversary of the announcement. Now, coming up, we have just passed <laughs> the uh, second anniversary of the announcement. Our first public session took place on the 27th of March of that year, so we're coming up to that. And our first oral evidence session was on the 14th of June, 2007. It's a public inquiry but not a statutory inquiry. Only the government could establish that. And there have been two consequences. First, we have no power to compel anyone to give evidence or to produce documents. However, we haven't been left entirely without evidence. Over 300 witnesses submitted statements. It wasn't possible to hear oral evidence from all of them but 64 witnesses gave oral evidence. Um, you'll find a list of the witnesses in the appendix to the report. In addition, we've been provided with over 20,000 documents. And that leads us to the second consequence of the fact that we weren't government sponsored. A government inquiry would normally have been provided with the services of counsel for the inquiry and a substantial number of researchers to sift all the